493rd abbot folded his wrinkled hands and addressed Lutze, one of the most senior monks. The place is Omnia, he said, on the Latian coast. I remember, said Lutze, dry place. Haven't been to Omnia for all, oh, must be 700 years. Off you go then. I shall take my mountains, said Lutze. The climate will be good for them. It was the year of the notional serpent, which meant that the time of the eighth prophet was imminent. And it came to pass that in that time the great god Om spake unto Baratha, the chosen one. Psst! Baratha paused in mid ho and stared around the temple garden. Pardon? It was a fine day early in the lesser spring. Bees loafed around in the bean blossoms, but buzzed fast in order to give the impression of hard work. High above, a lone eagle circled. And at the far end of the garden, old brother Lutze was dreamily forking over the dung heap. Baratha shrugged and got back to the melons. Yea, the great god Om spake again. Psst! Baratha hesitated. Perhaps it was a demon. The thing to do was to be resolute and repeat the nine fundamental aphorisms. Once more, the great god Om spake unto Baratha. Are you deaf, boy? The hoe thudded onto the baking soil. Get thee behind me, demon. I am behind you. Baratha turned again slowly. The garden was still empty. The third thing people noticed about Vorbis was his height. He was well over six feet tall, but stick thin. The second thing that people noticed about Vorbis was his eyes. Not just dark of pupil, but almost black of eyeball. It was as if he had sunglasses on under his skin. But the first thing they noticed was his skull. Most of the church's ministers cultivated long hair and beards that you could lose a goat in, but Deacon Vorbis was bald by design. He shaved all over, he gleamed, and lack of hair seemed to add to his power. He didn't menace, he never threatened, for Vorbis was the head of the Quisition, and he knew his destiny. Hadn't the god himself told him? He didn't often go down to watch the Inquisitors at work. Exquisitors didn't have to. He sent down instructions, he received reports, but special circumstances merited his special attention. Currently, he was sitting alongside the bench on which lay what was still technically the trembling body of Brother Sasho, formerly his secretary. He leant over. What were their names? Don't know. Sasho, they are treacherous heretics. Don't no names. I trusted you, Sasho. You betrayed the church. No names. Truth is surcease from pain, Sasho. Truth. Yes. Sasho opened his one remaining eye. Truth. Yes. The turtle moves. Baratha picked up his hoe and turned back to the vines. The blade was about to hit the ground when he saw the tortoise. It was small and basically yellow and covered with dust. Its shell was badly chipped. It had one beady eye. Baratha looked around. The gardens were well inside the temple complex and surrounded by high walls. How did you get in here, little creature? He said. Did you fly? The tortoise stared monoptically at him. I don't think tortoises are allowed in the gardens. Aren't you vermin? The tortoise continued to stare. How would you like a grape, little tortoise? How would you like to be an abomination in the nethermost pit of chaos? Said the tortoise. Eventually, Baratha opened his eyes and took his fingers out of his ears. I'm still here. It dawned on Baratha very slowly that demons and succubi didn't turn up looking like small old tortoises. I didn't know tortoises could talk, 
he said. They can't read my lips. Brother looked closer. You haven't got lips. No, I'm doing it straight into your head and I don't have to waste time on gardeners. Go and fetch the top man right now. Top man? The high priest or whatever he calls himself. I suppose there is one. Brother nodded blankly. High priest, right? High priest? I can't go asking the... Brother hesitated. Even the thought of talking to the Cenobiarch frightened him. I can't ask anyone to ask the High Cenobiarch to talk to a tortoise. Turn into a mud leech and wither in the fires of retribution. The tortoise bounced up and down furiously. There's no need to curse. That wasn't a curse. That was an order. I am the great god Om. Brother blinked. No, you're not. I've seen the great god Om. He comes as an eagle, or a lion, or a mighty bull. There's a statue in the great temple. It's got horns of real gold. I am the great god Om, said the tortoise, in a menacing and unavoidably low voice. And before very long, you are going to be a very unfortunate priest. Novice. What? Novice, not priest. Get him! Fetch him now, or the moon will be as blood, and agues and boils will afflict mankind! I'll see what I can do, said Baratha, backing away. His grubby robe disappeared through the gateway. Vorbis's room was in the upper citadel, which was unusual for a mere deacon. He hadn't asked for it. He seldom had to ask for anything. He also got visited by some of the most powerful men in the church's hierarchy. Not, of course, the six archpriests or the Cenobiarch himself. They were merely at the top. The people who really run organisations are usually found several levels down. Two of them were with him now. They were General Iam Friat, who ran the Divine Legion, and Bishop Daruna, secretary to the Congress of Iams. And now, Vorbis said, the matter of Ephibi. After what they did to poor brother Murdoch. The insults to all. This must not pass. What is your proposed? Uh, no more fighting, said Fright. We've lost too many already. They fight like mad. They have strong gods, said Daruna. There is no god but Om, said Vorbis. Have you seen this? pushed forward a scroll of paper. Daruna gave it a cautious examination. I believe there are other copies, even in the Citadel. This one belonged to Sasho. It is to be regretted that he has not been induced to give us the names of his fellow heretics. General Fryat fought against the sudden rush of relief. His eyes met those of Vorbis. De Chelonian Mobile, Daruna said. The turtle moves. What does that mean? Vorbis's eyes had not left Fried. The writer claims that the world travels through the void on the back of four huge elephants which stand on the shell of an enormous turtle. <laughs> Daruna grinned nervously. And the man who wrote this walks around free in a Phoebe now. The council want to parley with a Phoebe, said Daruna. I have to organise a deputation to leave tomorrow. How many soldiers? A bodyguard only, said Fright. We have been guaranteed safe passage. And once inside, can we surprise them? We? I shall lead the party. I was just musing as to the possibilities should we be provoked. Fright clicked his knuckles. A habit of his whenever he was worried. We have given them our word. There is no truce with unbelievers. But the palace of Ephibi is a labyrinth. No one gets in without a guide. In my experience, there is always another way, which the god will show in his own good time. And we must not forget poor brother Murdoch. He was unarmed and alone. Fear is strange soil. 
Mainly it grows obedience, like corn which grows in rows and makes weeding easy. But sometimes it grows the potatoes of defiance, which flourish underground. The Citadel had a lot of underground. There were the pits of the Quisition, there were cellars and sewers, forgotten rooms, even natural caves in the bedrock itself. This was such a cave. Smoke came from the fire in the middle of the floor. There were a dozen figures in the dancing shadows. They wore rough hoods. And something about the way most of them moved suggested men who were used to carrying weapons. On one wall of the cave, there was a drawing. It was vaguely oval, a child's drawing of a turtle. We must kill Vorbis, said a mask. Not in a Phoebe, said another. It must happen here, when we're strong enough. Then one of us must go to a Phoebe and save the master. If he really exists, he exists. His name is on the book. Didactylus, a strange name. It means two-fingered, you know. Bring him back here, if possible, and the book. One of the masks seemed hesitant. His knuckles clipped nervously. But will people rally behind a book? They're peasants. They need a symbol. We have one! Instinctively, every masked figure turned to look at the drawing on the wall. The turtle moves. The turtle moves. The turtle moves! The leader nodded. And now we will draw lots. The great god Om waxed wrath, but there is a limit to the amount of wrath that can be waxed one inch from the ground. He cursed a beetle. The beetle plodded away. He cursed a melon unto the eighth generation, but the melon just sat there, ripening slightly. Well, when Om got back to his rightful shape and power, he told himself steps would be taken, and something really horrible would happen to all eagles. By the time the big boy arrived back with the waxy-skinned man, the great god Om was in no mood for pleasantries. What's this? he snarled. Baratha knelt down. This is Brother Noomrod, master of the novices. I didn't tell you to bring me some fat old pederast. Novice Baratha, Noomrod said, for what reason are you talking to a small tortoise? Because it's talking to me, isn't it? Brother Noomrod looked down at the small one-eyed head poking out of the shell. Tortoises was a new one. I have to tell you, Baratha, that it is not talking. You can't hear it? I cannot hear it. It told me it was the great god. Ah, well, this sort of thing is not unknown amongst young men recently called to the church. The tortoise bounced up and down. Smite ye with thunderbolts! I find healthy exercise is the thing, and plenty of cold water. Noomrod wandered off towards the kitchens. There's very good eating on one of these, you know. They make excellent soup. Baratha leant against the wall and looked down at the tortoise. I know you're not the great god, Om, he said. The great god would never become a tortoise, but it says in the book of the prophet Sina that when he was wandering in the desert, the spirits of the ground and the air spoke unto him. The tortoise gave him a one-eyed stare. I think I'll recall him. Tall fella, full beard, talked to himself, walked into rocks a lot. He wandered in the wilderness for three months. Yeah, that explains it. Perhaps. You are a demon. Your teeth to abscess with red-hot heat. Pardon? I swear to me that I am Om, greatest of gods. Your lying tongue cannot tempt me, reptile, for I am strong in faith. The tortoise grunted with effort. Smite you with thunderbolts. A small, a very small black cloud appeared over Baratha's head and a small, very small bolt of lightning lightly singed an eyebrow. Ouch! Now do you believe me? 
Baratha hoed the bean rows for the look of the thing. The great god Om ate a lettuce leaf. In the rainforests of Baratha's subconscious, the butterfly of doubt emerged and flapped an experimental wing, all unaware of what chaos theory has to say about this sort of thing. I feel a lot better now, said the tortoise. Better than I have for months. Months? How long have you been ill? What day is it? Tenth of Garoon. What year? Um, National Serpent. Then, three years. This is good lettuce. Let there be another leaf. Baratha pulled one off the nearest plant, and lo, there was another leaf. And you were going to be a bull? Open my eyes, my eye, and I was a tortoise. Why? I... I don't know, lied the tortoise. But you're omnicognizant. That doesn't mean I know everything. Yes, it does. Thought that was omnipotent. No, that means all-powerful. And you are. That's what it says in the Book of Ossory. Who told him? You did. No, I didn't. He said that you spoke unto him from out of a pillar of flame. Oh, that ossery. And you dictated to him the book which contains the directions, the abjurations and the precepts. 193 chapters. I don't think I did all that. Perhaps he wrote it himself. Baratha put his hands over his mouth in horror. That's blasphemy! Oh! Baratha removed his hand. That's blasphemy! How can I blaspheme? I'm a god! I don't believe you. Want another thunderbolt? You call that a thunderbolt? The tortoise hung its head sadly. All oh, right, not much of a one, I admit. If I was better, you'd have just been a pair of sandals with smoke coming out. It looked wretched. I don't understand it. I intended to be a great big roaring white bull for a week and ended up a tortoise for three years. I was beginning to think I was a tortoise dreaming about being a god. Perhaps you are. Your legs to swell to tree trunks. But, but you're saying that prophets were just men who wrote things down. It wasn't from you. Some of it, perhaps. I've forgotten so much the past few years. The tortoise paused. Can I say something? Om searched his fading memory. I remember a summer day. You were 13. Your grandmother had beaten you for stealing cream, which in fact you had not done. She locked you in your room and you said, I wish you were... Vorbis strolled through the citadel. He always made a point of taking a daily walk through some of the lower levels. He rounded a corner and saw, scratched crudely on the wall opposite, a rough oval with four crude legs and even cruder head and tail. He smiled. There seemed to be more of them lately. Let heresy fester. Let it come to the surface like a boil. Vorbis knew how to wield the lance. But the second or two of reflection had made him walk past a turning, and instead he stepped out into the sunshine. This was one of the walled gardens. Bean vines raised red and white blossoms towards the sun. Melons baked gently on the dusty soil, and a plump young novice was rolling in the dust with his fingers in his ears. Vorbis prodded Baratha with his sandal. What ails you, my son? Baratha opened his eyes. There weren't many members of the hierarchy he could recognise. Even the Cenobiarch was a distant blob in the crowd, but everyone recognised Vorbis the Exquisitor. Baratha fainted. How very strange. There was a small tortoise near his foot, hissing like a kettle. Vorbis picked it up, examined it carefully, found a spot in full sunshine, and put the reptile down on its back. After a moment's thought, he wedged a couple of pebbles under the shell so that the creature's movement wouldn't tip it over. Then he turned his attention to Baratha. There was a hell for blasphemers. There was a hell for liars. There was probably a hell for little boys who wished their grandmothers were dead. The Omnians had a great many hells. 
concurrently, Baratha was going through all of them. Brother Noomrod and Brother Vorbis looked down at him, tossing and turning on his bed like a beached whale. It's the sun, said Noomrod. The poor lad works all day in that garden, a very willing lad. He's the one I told you about. He doesn't look very sharp. He's not. Yet you tell me his tutors speak highly of him, Noomrod shrugged. He is very obedient and, well, there's his memory. He has got a good memory. It's superb. A devoutly read young man. He can't read. All right. How then has he become such a capable pupil? He listens. He listens to everything. And he takes it all in. Vorbis stared down at Baratha. He appeared to be thinking deeply. Loyal, loyal and devout, and a good memory. Send him to see me when he has recovered. I may have a use for him. Yes, Lord. For, I suspect, the great god Arm moves in mysterious way. The sun beat down on the upturned shell of Om. An upturned tortoise is the ninth most pathetic thing in the entire multiverse. An upturned tortoise who knows what's going to happen to it next is, well, at least up there at number four. You died if you had no believers. That was what a small god generally worried about. But you also died if you died. He was too tired to waggle his legs now. I'm on my back and getting hotter and I'm going to die. And yet that bloody eagle had dropped him on a compost heap, the one thing that would break his fall without breaking him as well, and really close to a believer. Made you wonder if it wasn't some kind of divine providence, except that you were divine providence. And on your back, getting hotter, preparing to die, a shadow crossed the sun. Om squinted up into the face of Lutze, who turned him the right way up, picked up his broom and wandered off without a second glance. Sergeant Simony waited until he was back in his own quarters before he unfolded his scrap of paper. It was marked with a small drawing of a turtle. He was the lucky one. Someone had to bring back the writer of the truth to be a symbol for the movement. It had to be him. The only shame was that he couldn't kill Vorbis. That had to happen where it could be seen, in front of the temple, one day. Bloody useless boy, on thought, served himself right by trying to talk to a novice, but where did it leave him? It left him in this wretched garden. Nothing else for it, he'd have to find the Cenobiarch himself. A high priest would be bound to be able to hear him, and he should be easy enough to find. He'd have to go upwards. That's what a hierarchy meant. You found the top man by going upwards. Wobbling slightly, his shell jerking from side to side, the former great god Om set off to explore the citadel erected to his greater glory. High above, no sound but the hiss of wind in feathers. The eagle stood on the breeze, looking down at the toy buildings of the citadel. It had dropped it somewhere, and now it couldn't find it. Somewhere down there, in that patch of green. There were few steps in the citadel. The progress of the many processions that marked the complex rituals of Great Om demanded long, gentle slopes. Such steps as there were, were low enough to encompass the faltering steps of very old men, and there were so many very old men in the citadel. But the tortoise has very inefficient legs. Thou shalt build shallower steps, he hissed, hauling himself up. The feet thundered past him a few inches away. This was one of the main thoroughfares of the citadel, leading to the place of lamentation. Anyone could go to the place of lamentation. It was one of the great freedoms of Omnianism. Prayers and entreaties could be offered up. They would assuredly be heard. They might even be heeded. Behind the place, which was a square 200 metres across, rose the great temple itself. When the sun rose, the doors of the central temple blazed like fire. They were bronze and 100 feet tall. 
On them, in letters of gold, were the commandments. There were 512 so far. It was generally believed that staring fixedly at the golden horns on the temporal roof while uttering the prayer gave it added potency. Thousands of pilgrims visited the place every day. A heel knocked Om's shell, bouncing him off the wall. On the rebound, a crutch caught the edge of his carapace and whirled him away into the crowd, spinning like a coin. The god blinked muzzily. This was nearly as bad as eagles. He caught a few words before another passing foot kicked him away. The drought has been on our village for three years. A little rain, oh Lord. Rotating on the top of his shell, vaguely wondering if the right answer might stop people kicking him, the great god muttered, No problem. Another foot bounced him, unseen by any of the pious, between the forest of legs. The world was a blur. Then he landed right side up in a brief, clear space visible. From his perch on the horns of the temple, the eagle leapt into the sky. Eagles are single-minded creatures. Once the idea of lunch is fixed in their mind, it tends to remain there until satisfied. The tortoise's one eye swiveled upwards in dread anticipation. A small grey priest ushered Baratha into a small, barely furnished room. He pointed at a stool. Baratha sat down. The priest vanished behind a curtain. Baratha took one glance around the room and blackness engulfed him. A voice by his ear said, Now, brother, I order you not to panic. They put a hood over your face. All the novices knew that. Stories were told in the dormitories, so the inquisitors didn't know who they were working on. Hands guided him across the floor. He felt the brush of the curtain and then was jolted down some steps and into a sandy floored room. There is a stool behind you. Be seated. Baratha sat. You may remove the hood. Seated on the stools at the far end of the room were three figures. He recognized Deacon Vorbis. The other two were a short, stocky man and a very fat one, a genuine lard tub. All three wore plain grey robes. There was no sign of any branding irons. Novice Baratha, said Vorbis. Baratha nodded. Do you recognise these learned fathers? Baratha shook his head. They have some questions to ask you. Baratha nodded. The very fat man leant forward. Do you have a tongue, boy? Baratha presented it for inspection. Vorbis smiled. Baratha, please put it away. Now, when you first came into my apartment, you were in the anteroom for a few seconds. Please describe it. About three meters square, white walls. There is a window about two meters up, um, three bars in the window. There is a holy icon of the prophet ossuary carved from a fascia wood and there's a scratch in the bottom left hand corner of the frame there is a shelf under the window there is nothing on the shelf but a tray on the tray a bronze thimble two needles and a length of cord three knots in the cord and nine coins were on the tray tell me about the coins three were citadel scents two showing the horns and one the sevenfold crown this is some sort of trick, said the fat man. Baratha, tell us about the other coins. They were bronze. Direct my from a Phoebe. How do you know this? I have seen them once before, Lord. When was this? I think it was around midday on Garoon the Third in the year of the astounded beetle. Some merchants came to our village. How old were you? I was within one month of three years old, Lord. Can you remember everything that's ever happened to you? Said the stocky man. Uh, no, Lord. Most things. What is the first thing you can remember, my son? Said Vorbis kindly. There was a bright light, and then someone hit me. The three men stared at him blankly. Then they turned to one another. The stocky man nodded. The fat man shrugged. Baratha, said Vorbis. Return to your dormitory now. 
You will report to the Gate of Horns at dawn tomorrow, and you will come with me to Ephebi. You know about the delegation to Ephebi? Baratha shook his head. We are going to discuss political matters with the tyrant. Do you understand? Baratha shook his head. Good. It was only a matter of time before the eagle stopped circling and swooped. The great god Om scurried towards the nearest statue. The statue happened to be himself as a bull trampling an infidel, although this was no great comfort. Gods had no one to pray to, but everyone needs someone. Baratha! Baratha gravitated towards the garden. There were beans to tie up. You knew where you were with beans. Besides, if he was going to be away for a while, he ought to mulch the melons and explain things to Lutze. Lutze came with the gardens. Every organisation had someone like him. Everyone knows who they are, and no one remembers a time when they weren't there, or knows where they go to when they're not, well, where they usually are. Generally, Lutze was pushing a broom or turning over a heap of compost. When Baratha entered, he was raking the paths. He was good at raking paths. He left scallop patterns and gentle, soothing curves. Baratha hardly ever spoke to Lutze, because it didn't matter much what anyone ever said to Lutze. The old man just nodded and smiled his single-toothed smile. I'm going away for a little while. Nod, smile. Understand? Nod, smile. Nod, smile, beckon. What? Nod, smile, beckon. Nod, smile, beckon, smile. Lutze walked his little crab monkey walk to a little area at the far end of the walled garden. There was a small trestle table in the sun by a stack of bean canes. A straw mat had been spread on it, and on the mat were half a dozen pointy-shaped rocks, none of them bigger than a foot high. A careful arrangement of sticks had been constructed around them. Bits of thin wood shadowed some parts of the rock, Small metal mirrors directed sunlight towards other areas. Paper cones at odd angles appeared to be funneling the breeze to very precise points. Baratha had never heard about the art of bonsai and how it was applied to mountains. De, very nice. Nod, smile, pick up a small rock, smile, urge, urge. Oh, I really couldn't urge, urge. Baratha took the tiny mountain. It had a strange, unreal heaviness. To his hand, it felt like a pound or so, but in his head, it weighed thousands of very, very small tons. It's very mountainous. Nod grin. There can't really be snow on the top, can? Baratha! His head jerked up, but the voice had come from inside. Oh no, he thought wretchedly. Baratha! Oh, that was a dream, wasn't it? No, it wasn't! Help me! The petitioners scattered as the eagle made a pass over the place of lamentation. It wheeled only a few feet above the ground and perched on the statue of Great Om trampling the infidel. It was a magnificent bird, golden brown and yellow eyed, and it surveyed the crowds with blank disdain. It's a sign, said an old man with a wooden leg. Yes, a sign, said a young woman next to him. They gathered around the statue. It's a bugger, said a small voice from around their feet. But what's it a sign of, said an elderly man. It could be a messenger from the great god himself. It's a point. I mean, there's something very godly about an eagle. It's only a better looking turkey, said the voice. Brain the size of a walnut. Very intelligent, too. Interesting fact, eagles are the only birds to work out how to eat tortoises. They pick them up and drop them on the rocks. Amazing. That sounds dreadful. I wonder what passes through the poor little creature's head when he's dropped. He shall, madam, said the great god Om. At that moment, trumpets rang out across the place. The eagle leapt into the air. The worshippers fought to get out of its way as it dipped across the flagstones and then rose majestically towards the hot sky. Below it, the doors of the great temple, each one forty tons of gilded bronze, opened ponderously and silently. 
brother's enormous sandals flapped and flapped on the flagstones. He ran from the knees, lower legs thrashing like paddle wheels. The square, normally alive with the susurration of a thousand prayers, had gone quiet. The pilgrims had all turned to face the temple. Baratha shouldered his way through the crowd. Baratha! The Cenobiarch was returning to his apartment after conducting the evening service. Baratha leant against the statue, panting. No one was paying him any attention. They were all watching the procession. Watching the procession was a holy act. Baratha knelt down and peered into the scrollwork around the base of the statue. One beady eye glared back at him. How did you get under there? It was touch and go, said the tortoise. I tell you, I never had this trouble when I was a bull. The number of eagles who can pick up a bull, you can count on the fingers of one head. There's good eating on one of them, you know, said a voice. Baratha stood up guiltily, the tortoise in his hand. Oh, hello, Mr. Dehibla. Everyone in the city knew cut me own hand off Dehibla, purveyor of suspiciously new holy relics, suspiciously old sweetmeats on a stick, and long past the sell-by dates. He was there every dawn, selling sticky things to the pilgrims, and the sight of someone in the place trying to unstick their jaws with dignity was a familiar one. Many a devout pilgrim, after a thousand miles of perilous journey, was forced to make his petition in sign language. Fancy some sherbet for afters, said Debler, hopefully. I'm not going to eat it. Going to teach it tricks, then? Look through hoops, that kind of thing? Who is this fool? said Om. Get rid of him. Shut up. No need to be like that. I wasn't talking to you. Talking to the tortoise, were you? My old mum used to talk to a gerbil. Anyway, it'll be company on your journey. What journey? To Ephebe, the secret mission to talk to the infidel. Baratha knew he shouldn't be surprised. News went around the enclosed world of the citadel like bushfire after a drought. Can I press you to a candid sultana? On a stick? There were 23 other novices in Baratha's dormitory, on the principle that people by themselves might indulge in solitary cogitation. It was well known that this stunted your growth. For one thing, it could lead to your feet being chopped off. So Baratha had to retire to the garden. He fished out his god from the pocket of his robe. Look, I didn't have a chance to tell you. I'm going to Ephebe on a mission to the infidels. Deacon Vorbis picked me. Who's he? He's the chief exquisitor. He makes sure you're worshipped properly, lets out the badness and the heresy in people. There may be a little pain, but it ensures less time in the hells after death. But what if the Exquisitors are wrong? They can't be wrong. They are guided by the hand of, 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 of by your hand. I mean, your claw. The testament of Ossery is very clear on the matter. We are judged in life as we are in death. Ossery 3, chapter 6, verse 56. My grandmother said that when people die, they have to cross a terrible desert. They come before you, and you weigh their heart in some scales. And if it weighs less than a feather, they are spared the hells. Om looked up at Baratha. He really believes, he thought. The strength of Baratha's belief burnt in him like a flame. And then the truth hit Om like the ground hits tortoises after an attack of eagles. The thing about Baratha's flame of belief was this. In all the citadel, in all the day, was the only one that God had found. And the tortoise thought of the silent wastes of the deep desert, and the gods who had faded away to mere voices on the air. Gods who were left behind, gods with no more believers. Not even one. One was just enough. You've got to take me to this Ephebe place, he said urgently. He was trying to keep his innermost thoughts calm in case Baratha heard. Don't Leave me behind. General Fryatt was trying to pray. He hadn't done so for a long time. Of course, there'd been the eight compulsory prayers every day, but in the pit of the wretched night, he knew them for what they were. A habit. And he'd drunk too much tonight. 
from a secret cache of wine whose discovery would lead him into the machinery of the Inquisitors within ten minutes. He squeezed his eyes shut again, and all he could see was the face of Vorbis. Vorbis knew about him. He must do! How much had he got out of Sasha? Had he said what he knew? Of course he'd say what he knew. Something went snap inside Fright. He glanced at his sword hanging on the wall. Why not? After all, if he was going to spend all eternity in a thousand hells, he staggered to his feet and got the sword belt off the wall. Vorbis's quarters weren't far away. One stroke. He could cut Vorbis in half without trying, and he could get to Ephebe, maybe, across the desert. He reached the door and fumbled for the handle. It turned of its own accord and the door swung inwards. Vorbis was standing there in the flickering light of an oil lamp. The sword clattered out of Wright's hand. Is there something wrong, brother? Vorbis smiled and stepped into the room. Two hooded inquisitors slipped in behind him.